Hi friends, good morning and wishing you all a very happy new year. Welcome to this webinar on CPP certification. I'm trying to good morning. Good morning. become a recognized expert in procurement. Let me set the tone first. You're well aware that the role of procurement is no more what it used to be three decades back or two decades back. If I go back, because my journey dates back to 72, so I can speak much more confidently. If I talk of 70s, 80s, even 1990s, procurement was a purely reactive function. And everybody thought anybody can do procurement. So, but from those generate, even I'd say the last two decades, it has moved from reactive function to very strategic function. So when we say strategic function, we, you need some professional knowledge. You need to plan. You have to have good market knowledge. You need to understand how can I consolidate my requirements? How can I negotiate around? If there's a disruption, how do I manage it? And now when we're coming with the digitization, you need to know how is what is big data? How can I make best use of big data? The whole procurement has transformed from a purely reactive to strategic function. So that means it is becoming a profession. It is not just a function. I would say it's a profession. So when I say the word profession, that means it requires a book of knowledge. It requires a skill. While in the reactive function, the focus was all on skill. I've got 20 years experience. Somebody will say I've got 15 years experience. But the knowledge was very limited to very basic functions. And now we need much more than that. We talk of category management. We talk of data management. We're talking of now artificial intelligence. We're talking of automating some functions. So you can imagine around the procurement has moved a lot. The function which were done three decades back are going to be automated. Let me tell you very honestly. Some reactive functions, they are going to be automated in time to go. So the whole program is getting changed. And procurement is a major part of the whole supply chain. If we talk of supply chain, starts from planning, goes to procurement, from procurement I have logistics. And then after logistics, I'm doing my in-house operations and then distribution to the various places. So procurement is a major pillar, I would say. And as you know, in procurement, if you see the spend of any companies, particularly those which are manufacturing companies, like auto companies, 70% goes into supply chain and major component is procurement. Think of pharma companies, around 50% in supply chain and 40% goes to procurement. We talk of any sectors around, in service sector, it may be around 30% or 40%. But still, procurement is a major, major differentiator. If I have to say some companies doing a great job, I would say the people say supply chain is a differentiator. But in addition, I would say supply chain because the major pillar is procurement. So procurement becomes the differentiator. Recently, one study was done by Monster. If I'm sure everybody knows about the company called Monster because they have a branch in India also. Monster is very popular in US for recruitment purpose. They did a study around guys, which carrier is the best one. Honestly, it was a surprise to me also. And they have ranked among the top 10, procurement is one of the top 10. The very first one was on the audit side. Second was on the consulting side. Procurement was coming around sixth. And the reason for that, when I say they were ranking among the top carriers, two reasons, obviously. One, this is the only profession which connects with everybody. If you go back in your own job, you know very well, you are the most important person for every function. Anyone, everybody is spending some money, and that means they have to go through procurement. So your most important functions, it needs a lot of cross functional and those people who don't understand the cross-functional part, I think they are not fit for procurement. I'll call it. Any good procurement person needs a business acumen, understanding the money matters, understanding your stakeholders, managing the relationship with suppliers. Those are becoming very important around. So when I was looking at, they basically went around which are the ones which gives you 
the happy index. I'm sure you must have heard around which countries have got more happy index. So they were trying to find which carrier is giving the most happy index. Procurement is one of the top ones. And one reason could also be, if I take to COVID-19, the last year's particularly, 2020, there was hardly any job losses in procurement. On the contrary, the procurement has become the front face. It's become the most important function nowadays. So when we talk of this all changes and importance, that means procurement is, needs to be professionalized. Good old days are gone that, oh, I've done a little bit of finance, a little bit of this. No, you need a combination of many skills. Skill of negotiation, skill of understanding cost and price, skill of sourcing internationally, skill of negotiating with international people, skill of digitizing your activities around. So that means you need a much more skills around. Even you need to understand the psychology of the people, how to read people. When you meet the supplier, how do we read them? How do we read the body language of people around? So this being the major function, I would say there's a need to professionalize. So, when we talk of professionalizing, that means you need to, how do I know that somebody's got experience? Fine. But then the certification becomes very important. So when we talk of certifications, I put myself, when I took over as initially as a director for the UN supply chain, and then later on, I became the chairperson, I made it a mandatory. We will not hire anybody who's not certified. And we developed our own certification within the UN first. So, because we want some people who understand the basic guidelines, not just the process. Some people think I know the five steps, step one, step two, I'm a procurement expert. No, you need to know much more than that. So we came with that. So professionalization means you need to have some certifications from well-known institutions. Now, there are different level of skill requirements around. I'll be explaining a little later. So those, depending on the skill, we have different programs around. And these, again, on the international level, if I talk around, there are well-known ISM comes in the top. ISM is the oldest and the largest organization based in Arizona, in Phoenix. And they have branches in around 70 countries. ISM India is handled by us. So they can imagine around. There are others also. I'm not undermining others, but since this being the oldest one, we are very proud of to be associated with this one now. Well, friend, let this now, let me put it up. As you can see in the first slide, I'm going to talk about CPP, Certified Procurement Professional. So when I say somebody is CPP, or somebody is APP, somebody has got CPSM, or somebody has done in the blockchain, or somebody has done in negotiation, or somebody has done in the contract management, or category management, so what are we doing? The certificate means we are validating your knowledge, your skill, and obviously experience of handling the subject around. So once we are able to validate, and the validate means obviously is online exams around in this case, we assume that you are the best recognized expert in the procurement field around. Now let me get down to the key takeaways for this. So we have one hour session. If it goes a little more, if you're okay, I'll be very happy to extend the session. The learning system of CPP covers the following module. There are six modules we took around. The module one is on contracting. The whole solicitation process, RFI, RFQ, RFP, whatever you want to talk about, the whole contracting process. Then comes the negotiation part. The guys, Okay, I got the offers, now I apply to, I want to negotiate. How do I go about it? Should I tell the guy, give me 10% discount? That's not negotiation. We need to negotiate. How do we go about it? The second module is about cost and finance. At the end of the day, when you are looked at it, if you're dealing with the finance people, say, guys, okay, how much saving you brought around? How much value you're adding around? We don't want to be considered procurement as a cost center. We want procurement to be a profit center. Then we also will have another module on sourcing. 
So there are sourcing strategies around. If I've got too much risk, my approach is different. If I'm spending a lot of money, but the risks are less, my approach is different. But if my risks are more, my approach is different. So it is not one size for all. Strategic sourcing. So as I said to you in the very beginning, that's not a purely reactive function. Follow the same rules for everybody. No, it's not one size for all. Strategic means we strategize our sourcing. So I'll go with you, through with you, the seventh step of this. The next one is supplier relationship. If I go three decades back, nobody talked about the relationship. In the customer side, we had CRM, customer relationship management. But then we forget the supplier is the one who starts upstream. The water, if I talk about the water stream, it starts from supplier. That's my upstream. Downstream is my customer. On the customer side, we are maintaining CRM. The person who's giving me the parts, I'm only assembling it. Or if I'm working in a company like Apple, I'm not even assembling it. I'm only managing the supply chain end to end. And I depend on suppliers. So supplier relationship is also important. Like last year, we went through disruption. People were not able to deliver it. So in those situations, my relationship will go a long way. And the last is legal part. In procurement, whatever you guys do, a word is not a perfect thing all the time. There could be some disruption. There could be delay. The supplier could be a bad guy. You need to understand the risk part. What could be the potential risk? And how do I protect myself legally? Am I legally strong to understand it? Because obviously you have the lawyers, fine, but you need to understand yourself also, what are the basic things I have to do? How to write the letter, how to draft the purchase order, how to protect my terms and conditions around. So those things we'll talk about. But there are competencies level around. We have the technical level competencies, which is the very old ones, administrative functions, compliance, Taking care of the money, end of it. That's all. I have to just prove that this is being done as per the purchase order. And for that, we have a separate certification called APP. Right? There's another one is called operational part. So technical part is a very basic level, very basic level fresh from college. Then we come to operational guys. The guy wants to know something about sourcing approach, international sourcing, a little bit about negotiations. We talk on those. And the program which we're talking today is at the managerial level. So at this level, what we are looking around is the person has got the pre-license capabilities for operational part, technical level, and be able to develop, improve. So basically, we look, this program is meant for the people who are managing the function. So the CPP program is suitable for the people who are managing. The next level come professional. Professional means the people has gone one step ahead. You can put this person in an automobile company. You can put this person in a pharma company. You can put into IT companies around. They have a wider range of experience. They can fit in any sectors. And that's what we call professional. So those professionals, even if they want to go into e-commerce, they can fit in their roles. So this is the one which we have the program called Certified Professional in Supply Map. So it is not procurement. Procurement goes one step further. It is called supply management. This covers much more functions around the supply chain. I would say it covers to a lot extent the complete supply chain. Because logistic is covered, warehouse is covered, inventory is covered in that amount. And that's a program which is done through our headquarters. The next one comes advanced professional. So advanced professional means you have to do some extra than that in the field of digital world. You need to know what is AI, what is big data, what is blockchain. Then we can say I'm advanced. You can imagine around for each level, the five levels, we have certification. So at technical level, we have APP. At a managerial level, we have CPP, the one I'm going to talk about. And professional level costs much more. 
if I would be talking a professional, then I'll be talking a project management. I would be talking about inventory management. I would be talking about warehousing. I'll talk about the complete logistics, risk management. So those will be the part which will be covered. Coming back to the next ones. Now here, the CPP again, as I said to you in the very beginning, it's a competitive market. It demands mastery and procurement. I won't have been saying this thing two decades back, but now over the time, this profession has really got the prominence around. Now, the, the way if I look around CPP, obviously is important for the career advancements around. Some people say got experience around, but when they apply for international companies or MNCs, they look for certification. They want to be doubly sure. Yes, you have an experience. But are you certified? And this program is flexible because this is on self-paced basis. It's online programs and it's credit work. This is how I'll call it around. Now, let me start very basic. Five or six slides that I take up, very generic on procurement. Procurement has got different parts. One is called direct procurement. One is called indirect procurement. Third is called even CapEx. And the direct also is sometimes called RMs. So one is direct, indirect people call it OPEX, operational procurement. Then there's MRO procurement, buying of materials like maintenance items. But if I had to summarize it, I'm not looking at the CapEx file. The CapEx could also be indirect procurement. So direct mean which goes into the end product. So I could not find a better example than the car. Anything you buy which goes into the car as an out output is a direct material. Indirect mean, which is just to mean run my plant. I may need to do lubrications. I may need to buy some gaskets. I may need to buy some other things around. Those are my indirect things. And then there come the services part. Services to keep the plant running. Services to improve my productivity is around. So those are the services combined together because quite a lot, 70% in auto companies. In the pharma companies in India is around 50%. And if it comes to electronic, it could be easily 80%. And if you're talking of Apple, it could be 100%. Let's look at the, what we have, the chain around. So the chain, when I look at it, so we have, the chain starts from the needs. The very first thing is the needs, identify the needs. This slide, which I'm showing you dates back to 1987. I had a one guy, German guy working with me in Copenhagen. So he designed for me. So this I still show in many programs around. Identify the needs. Write specs around. Writing a spec is an also R. Sometimes what happens is we get the specs what is given to us. And I've seen in some companies, those specs are not written by them, it's written by a supplier actually. I remember one very well-known company in Hyderabad and they were dealing with IT procurements. So in IT procurements, they were buying some software services. And software services, I said, who has written down? I asked the procurement guy, do you understand? He said, sir, I don't know. I've been told the name of the supplier. I've been given the specs. My job is only to negotiate. I told him the guys, what are you going to negotiate? The guy has already talked to the technical people. So already they know very well they are going to get the business. So that means you are not very powerful to negotiate now. So writing a spec is also important. Choose a procurement method. What method I should do? Should I go with RFP? Should I go with RFQ? Should I go with RFI? And then prepare the solicitation document, the bidding document. People may ask clarification and seek something. I evaluate the office. Now, evaluating offer is the next one. Then I shortlist them. Next date, and manage the contract. The last is evaluate. So managing the contract is equally important. I know most of the time, we don't even look at it. So there are three parts of the procurement, pre-contract, contract, post-contract. Post and the post-contract is managing the contract 
And if you put your heart hands on the, this one, on your own process wise, you will find that we don't spend too much time on the mind of the contract. And then we get into troubles also. In a very simple way, if I want to show around the government process, the planning is the very one. What to procure? Planning point, identify the sources, obtain the codes, selections, contact administration, and close out. Again, further, I've tried to spill it into three parts. Planning, I'm giving five steps. Again, solicitation and selection, I've given you six, seven, eight. Communicate, formal need for the vendors. Evaluate vendors, select vendors. And last is the post procurement part, negotiations, contact management, and all those things comes up in there. Statement of works, it should cover description of the scope around, location, period, deliverables part, standards. Okay. So we need to work it out what standard okay. should be. Acceptance credit. Okay. Yeah. I can see some kid has also joined us now. So good. Okay, guys, the next one is supply positioning. Some of the, you may be thinking what I'm covering around. I'll come to the subject soon, but let me start the base on it around. Supply positioning is equally important around the whatever supply you determined you're doing around. Let's try to split them into four boxes around, four quadrants around, based on spend, and based on risk. The spend mean I take 80 20 formulas, and risk is depending on my number of suppliers I've got. If I had only one supplier, my risk is highest. If I were 10, 15, or something suppliers, my risk is not there. If one does not behave, I can go to the second one. So this is where I want each one to understand what is the positioning of the suppliers. I can position the supplier into one of the four boxes, and my approach of procurement will depend on that. So evolutions, as you can see, starting from the price, cost management, strategic sourcing, category management, value management. At CPP level, we are only going up to strategic sourcing. But when we go to the next level, certainly we talk about category management, we talk about the value management. So this is where the CPPs, more or less, we try to focus on. The world class procurement, again, I can skip this. Strategic sourcing and SRF. This one, I think everybody should know at the CPP level also, procurement is not only one pillar. Procurement, depending on the size of the company, again, um, if the companies of only two people or three people, then you can't do it. But if the companies are 15, 20, 30 people, yes. You need to have a separate team for strategic sourcing, which we call source to contract. Other one is called P2P, that is procure to pay. And the last is vendor manager. If anybody is managing the vendor, and who should manage it? Should it be a separate pillar? Or should it be done by strategic sourcing? Or should it be done by procurement? I cannot answer now. It depends on company to company, their culture, other things as well. Now, procurement is moving from to supply management because it's becoming a bigger function now. So it's a part of the supply chain, very important part of the supply chain. So we are part of the supply chain. That factor has to be done around. And what can change it? Four parameters. If ever you're thinking of any transformation, keep in mind people are the key drivers. People need to be trained. Processes, technology, strategy. Why I'm touching this? Because when I was implementing ERP in 2005, worldwide to all my 200 country office. System looked good, but when we gave the system, everybody started saying, sir, this system is too difficult. We can't have, we don't have flexibilities around. So people are very important. Then I have to do the training around in all many countries around. So that gave me the chance to go around 89 countries. So I could see people are the key things. If people are not trained, all your ideas can fail. So we have to carry our team together with us. Technology, processes, strategy, everything is great, but people are the main, main driver to me. Okay, guys, let's start with the module one. I'll go with the six modules. I know the whole program I can't do in one hour, but I'll still try to do the key things enough. 
I'll take the very first modules. I'll walk through seven and eight key slides around. I'll take one quiz. Similarly, I'll follow for all the seven modules, six modules around. I hope that gives you a fairly good ideas how to clear the exam around. And this contracting, let me tell you what the learning opportunities are. If you are going through this program, the learning opportunities for you would be first thing is methods of communicating attributes. So that means specification. How do I communicate my specs? How should I write the specs? Now, type of solicitations. Should I go with open competition? Should I go with restricted competition? Should I go with RFP? Should I go with RFKI? All those things are there. So if you have any specific question on each one, let me know later, but I'll try to cover the key points here. Bitter conference, particularly in the public sector, those who are dealing with public sectors, for them, it's very important. They organize a bitter conference. They don't want later on getting a protest from supplier, oh, this was not, this was favoring X supplier. But in the private sector, this is not the issue, but the bitter conference are done mostly for the public sector. Then we talk about general solicitation process around. Then we, the next one is the terms and conditions. We have the bonds. Again, more in the public sector, we have a performance bond. Private sector also does sometimes. That I'm giving a big contract of $5 million. I want to be sure the performance will work. I don't want to lose my money. If supplier runs away, my manager will throw me out. He says, you're not protected the organization. So we will talk about various type of bonds and other type of surety so that my performance is assured something. Problem related to the solicitation. Negotiation philosophy. Should I be too strong with the supplier? And there's only one supplier. If I try to become too difficult, supplier will say, bye-bye, sorry, I don't want to work with you. But if you've got many choices, I'm powerful. Things are on my favoring side. My negotiation style will be different. And lastly is the contract, again, management. So this is where I'll take the key points around, but I've given you just of each headings. So your course content covers all these 10 headings around. So the very first one is the specs part. So when we talk of procurement specs, we'll be talking about specifying the goods, specifying the quantity, specifying the delivery requirements. How do you want the delivery to be done? Which place and how? Will it come by air? Will it come by train? Will it come by truck? Which input terms I'll use around? Specifying supplier service responsibility. If I'm buying something, let's say generator or anything around, is there any service requirements around? Do you need to be trained your people around? All that will be part of my specs. Or any other information you want on performance or something, security part, yes, you could put down there. When we talk of specification, this is also very critical. How we design the specs. Sometimes what we do, we take cut and paste from a catalog of a supplier. The moment I take cut and paste of a supplier specs, supplier is already decided. So my competition has no meaning. So that means we have to write the specification, not that I have to write each and every line, Let's say I'm buying a car. I'm not going to write the thickness of the door and thickness of this. I'm going to write my fuel mileage. How much is going to be the mileage? How much is going to be the noise level? What are the air conditioning performance level around? I like to look at the features around. So I'll try to put the functional requirement and the performance requirement. To a lot extent, performance specs could be written through standards. ISO standard, DIN standard, the British standard, Indian standard. So depending on what level you want to work around. One thing I've learned that whenever you buy anything, you must put down at the bottom, it's to protect you. The product must, shall conform to international standard. So tomorrow when you're not happy, you can say, I, I told you, this is not, and the, you don't know the standard, no problem. But if problem happened, you could take the benefit of the standard. Next come the design specs. Sometimes, oh, you know, the products are designed for a particular purpose. There are engineering drawings for that. So yeah, 
So it could be design specs, it could be performance specs, it could be functional specs, but behind all of them should be international standard. Because we are working in a global market. So try to get the guy, this word should be shell, not will. Shell is binding, will is not binding. So this is where I'm putting it around. The legal people are not going to come and teach you on this. You have to write in each email of yours, the right language also. Coming back to the spec, sometime what happened, we design our own, in our own world. I designed a board, beautiful board. I feel, oh, this is a great board. Can't I use the standard bolts and nuts, which are available in dozens? But if I put my own design, the price will go 12 times. So you need to look around, can I use internal specs or external specs? Around? So that is what you need to check it. This. The bidding documents, it could be informals, could be electronic, RFX, so you know all the things around. Type of bidding documents, again, this relates more to the public sector this page. So those of you who are coming from public sectors, so they may have this one, seal bids, completely proposals, formal advertising in the private sectors. We do it only for a very high level com context around very complex project, then yes, we do, otherwise not. So when we're talking again, this relates to public sector restricted competitions, non-competitive negotiations, two-step bidding. I mean, first I look at technical wise, I've got 20 checkpoints. If they meet my checkpoints, then I ask them, guys, give me more detail on this. Give me the price also. Alternative innovative proposals, pricing models, lotting strategy. So the lotting strategy, I can tell you, you'll get one question certainly on the lotting. The lotting means, let's say I'm buying my health supplies or I'm buying office supplies. I remember the time because we had around 250 types of office supplies, 20 types of pen, 30 types of markers, so many types of erasers, so many types of papers. Come on guys, if you're going to look at the price of each one, you'll be wasting your whole day. Then we put down all the 200 items. We say, guys, I'll go to one company, let's say Office Depot, then I'll go to another one. Compare them in totality basis. I'm not going to say, okay, this guy is selling me cheaper pen. Let me give the order to this. I'll look at the total lot. Health sectors, health supplies, medical supplies, and office supplies, and many things which are very small and you bundle them together as a lot. That's what you do. Now, this is another one we talk about, the bond and other types of sure. You want to be sure that you're giving a contract to someone. This guy will not create troubles for you later. They may leave you halfway. The bid bonds has to be there. The guys, if bidding for it, then they are giving you bid bond. The guy is okay, I'm paying 3% or 5%. As a bid bond, if the guy leaves you halfway, that money is gone. Performance. You are told the guy that I want the job to be done in 60 days or 30 days. If it is not done in 30 days, and after doing 30 days, the performance also I need, whatever you can say, I need for one year without any problems. So in those situations, my performance is assured. The payment bonds, deposits, letter of credits, so real estate. In, so all those factors, I know many of them doesn't pertain to you. So, but at least the bid bond could be there, performance bond could be there, letter of credit certainly there. So letter of credits, I would say, since you are the buyer, you have to issue the letter of credit. And letter of credit costs money. And so you can imagine around 2%, 3% lost around, you could come up the guy. If you can convince the supplier that you are a renowned company, why do we need LC? Some international suppliers may not agree, but if you have a good relationship, maybe overcome this. I never did anything else. My procurement was around $15 billion. Never. I took the benefit of the name of the companies. And later on with the name of the UN, I said, guys, why? I mean, you don't have a faith in us. So if you can avoid that, you can save some money. Another thing which is very important in this whole process of, I would call electronic negotiation. Reverse auction is an e-auction, but reverse 
One is forward auction where I sell, which you see many movies around. The guy is selling the painting, the guy is selling the house. That's a forward auction. Now you reverse the role, become reverse auction. But I'm doing this auction electronically. So in one day I say, guys, okay, you are five companies shortlisted. So tomorrow we'll do reverse auctions and we have the platform for that. You'll say, guys, during the lunch from 12 o'clock to one o'clock, all the companies, whichever you are shortlisted five, they can bid and that they will know, not know each other. They will know only their name is XYZ, but they don't know which company it is. Their prices could go up and down and goes in a gradual process. But it doesn't mean the price will change with 0.001, no, it changes with the step. You decide it has to be minimum step of 5% or 10%. So then they go through five or six steps or 10 steps. And then you find who's the best offerer, contract is awarded. Actually, many governments are doing around, even the government of India is doing around. There's a called GEM, Government Electronic Market. So they do very often, they are shortlisted names of the companies. So any department in the government, they can just call them up and do reverse auction. It's internet-based technologies. You schedule the date and time, secure environment for suppliers. Sellers don't know what they're bidding against. Sellers see the prices of their competitor. That's all. But they don't know the name of the competitor. Pricing occurs in real time. It's a dynamic situation. So I would say this is very important. I know 10 years back, I saw a few companies in the beginning in India, but now many companies are doing it. So one need to know what is reverse auction. Preparation for negotiation. Whenever you're doing negotiation, what do you look around? Even when I arrange a meeting with someone, try to look at the background of the person. Who is this person? What type of person it is? It gives you a head start. You need to know the strength and weakness of the people around. Companies also. If I'm dealing with a company which is already overbooked, they have a monopolies. That means they have a strength in comparison to them, I'm weak. My approach would be different. And if I'm dealing with a company where I'm the stronger one and they are looking for a business, I have the strength, they are the weaker one. And I'm dealing with a supplier who's financially very weak. So after taking two steps, the guy will say, sorry, can you give me some money? So you need to look around the strength and weakness. And that's what we call the SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunity, threats. Some supplier bring opportunity for you. Some supply bring threat for you. Similarly, your own company has some strength, has weakness also. But try to find good suppliers that it should not happen that you are also weak financially. Supplier is also weak financially, then you are in trouble. The next thing is four to five persons. I think this every procurement person should know about. What does it mean, five forces? So when you go for negotiation, you should know where do I stand? Am I stronger than supplier? What are my positions? Is supplier attractive to do business with me? Is he motivated to work with us? If supplier is not motivated to work with you, you will have difficulties. We and you, we all know very well, till you don't give the business, supplier will be after you. You will call, supplier will come running. But once you give the business, supplier will not come running to you. You will be going after the supplier. What happened? You can say the role reverses. And if they are not motivated, even in the beginning and later on after giving a contract, you'll be following them. Analyze the supplier proposal. Always analyze it, read it in depth. Develop buyer's objectives. What are you? What is the objective of the buyer and the supplier? If I know my objective is this, I want to make a best product, and this is the only supplier, I'll try to come with a wonderful relationship, long-term contact around, so that I can work with this. Then positioning of the supplier, which I showed you the slide in the beginning. Philosophies, some are win-win type. This is the most preferred one. Sometimes you may be today in a very strong position. Tomorrow you may not be. 
So crime may be in a strong position. So I think the what goes for a longer time is win-win situation, collaborative approach. In the good old days, it was all win-lose. I want to win because I'm paying money to you. Those days are gone. Treating supplier like a doormat is not going to work. It's become the relation become adversarial. I don't have a business today. If I go to the supplier, I'll request them. And if you're trying to dictate on me, I may listen to you. But later on, when my situation improves, I can ditch you. So that's a very loose tie. And sometimes, guys, they don't care for anybody. It's a very confrontation tie. So in short, the summary, I would say, if you're thinking of a long-term relationship, go with a win-win situation. If you're looking for a medium, short-term, win lose. But if you are not bothered around, disinterested, then yes, you could do lose-lose. The lose. tactics. Every negotiation, you have to work around a strategy. Even in your own personal life. Nothing comes in the plate automatically. You make a strategy, guys. I want to reach in five years, 10 years, this place. So you have a vision. So to read the vision, to read the target, you have your strategies. Nothing comes automatically. I think, you know, if you look at the Mahabharata, there also it is taught around how Krishna was teaching around. So keep in mind, we need to have strategies, but strategies don't work sometimes. Even you might have made the best strategy. It fails. So in those situations, you need to work out the tactics. So strategies and tactics goes together. And tactics means you could ask the supplier what type of questions around, listen effectively, use sound data, do some homework. And silence also is very important around. If I'm sitting in front of you, I'm a supplier, and you're the buyer. If I'm giving you something and you don't show anything and the face is totally cold, no actions, nothing, no other nod, neither yes, I'll get worried around whether you are interested in me. So that body languages I can read around. So do not become emotional, but never become emotional. If I see that you guys are not changing, then I'll change my tone itself and I'll try to see that I can divert to suit your expectations. Then there are caucuses. Then if you feel the meeting is not going well, we get out of the meetings. And then we again come with a new strategy. So there are many tactics. You have the everything around in your materials, so I don't need to repeat further on this. Now, on this, if we talk of the very first group around of the module one, I've taken one quiz. Now here is the supply professional is seeking competitive bids on 700 standard items, comparing bids on a part by part basis. It's a very time consuming. As I said to you, about 250 items for my office supplies, about 300 items in my hospitals. So, then which of the following would be the least appropriate course of action? Now, this is the way I feel, I'll, for the saving the time, I'll say, okay, first is the reverse option. I'm not getting into that. Solicit bids, no. Implement lotting strategies, or I should do price for each 150 items. Come on, guys, if I'm going to do the pricing for 150 item, I'll be spending another one week. Is it worth it? It's a C-class item. So here we call the lotting strategy. Take the lot as a whole. Put all the 150 items together in the request. Let them give the price of each one and total. So what you are comparing is the total. So that's the way we can do it. Next come the cost and finance. The very first one was contracting negotiations. You have much more material, I know. So when you go online, you will get much more. So I've covered the key points here. Cost and finance. Costing is important. At the end of the day, my management is going to ask if I'm in a procurement, guys, how much does it cost? Can we cut down the cost? Cost is my driver. And finance is also equally important around the contract with whom I'm giving. Is this company financially strong? Or do I assess? So that knowledge is important. I know in the colleges, we don't teach them except those who come from the commerce side, yes. 
But those who come from technical side, they are not even taught this at all. Those who come with MBA background, yes, they understand this. So this is where I feel cost and finance is equally important or not. Now the learning opportunity in this session, I'll cover only the smaller part, but the material which you have access gives you much more, the cost versus price. I should not say, I have asked many times people, what is the difference between a cost and a price? People have difficulty to answer. The guy who sells is a price. And that price becomes the, buy, the guy who buys it. For me, it's a cost. Supplier, when they sell me, is a price for their son. But for me, I'm buying a radiator. I'm buying engine from a company. I'm working in Maruti or I'm working in an automobile company. I'm buying filters. The filter, the one who's selling me, for them it's a price, but for me it's a cost. So cost versus price analysis. Issues to be considered when establishing a cost number. So if I want to analyze a cost, I want to negotiate, then I need to do the cost management framework. What is the direct cost? What is the indirect cost? What is the overheads? What is the administrative cost? All those parameters we need to know. Another thing is value analysis and value. Some people are wonderful designers, but their knowledge about business is zero. I'm saying from my own experience, after doing my MTech from IIT, when I started with Tata's very first, I used to design water pumps, the very first one. I did on the refrigerators. I did on the air conditioning, the mining equipment. So when we used to design, we were looking at the design looks very good, but we never looked around how much is the cost of making it? How it is going to be manufactured? Can I make a simple design, which is easier to make? I can cut the cost without compromising quality. So that is what we call the value engineering. After many years after leaving the design, then when I moved to the supply chain, then I thought I was a dumb guy designing all these things, but we never looked around the cost part. Because in the colleges, we were never taught about the business acumen. We were only taught how to be a good designer, but never looked at the manufacturing side, the value analysis. Sometimes what happens, you are in procurement, supplier comes and tells you guys, can we change the material for this? Without compromising qualities. And I always quote the example which happened with me. And again, we were making a lot of refrigerators, 1 million refrigerators in Voltas. And this story goes back to 1974. Each handle was costing us 35 rupees. I still remember it. Brass, chrome plated. Then supplier comes and tells the question, why the hell are you are doing of this brass? It's too many blows. Why don't you use material called ABS, acrylic, butadine styrene, and chrome plated? Much stronger than brass. Look as better as than that. And the price came from 35 rupees to 20 rupees, saving of 15 rupees. And 1 million refrigerators, 15 million rupees in 1972, you can think around, it would have given you the salary for the whole lifetime. One idea can give you a salary for the whole lifetime. That is what we call value analysis. So value analysis only after the design is released. Value engineering when the design is not released. I hope you got the clarity on the two subjects. Around. Cost modeling. How do I do the cost modeling? Now here I'm trying to give you examples so you get the understanding of it. Cost modeling in the good old days used to have time and motion studies. We used to have industrial engineers. They used to know the standard cost. To make this part, it takes one hour. To do the costing, raw material cost is so much. So they used to do very typical standard cost. But now the world has changed. They say, guy, your standard cost has no meaning to me. My customer cannot pay more than this. There's a target cost. The target cost and I work backward. Very good example, I can tell you that one of the well-known companies, I can see in the mobile, this one laptop business, they wanted to come with a hybrid system. And this story goes back to only seven, eight years back. HP was already there and this company also wanted to come into that. HP price was around $1,100. They said, guys, we want to come into this. 
And the salespeople said, okay, we can sell 2 million pieces, but the price should not be more than 1,050. And this 1,050 is given, the price is given to head of the procurement. Or you can say head of the supply chain company. The procurement is a part of it. Now you are the head. If I tell you that you have to get the laptop made, assembled, completely from outside, outsource, and I give you $1,050, the price should not go more than this. Now you're going to shift this $1,050 into different components, the keyboards, motherboards, all the items which goes into the laptop. Dividing this and passing on to the suppliers and ensuring that the price does not exceed 1,050, you're doing the target price, and then working backward, and then trying to find the suppliers. So that is what the problem is. So those of you, once you grow in your career, you'll find interesting, a very challenging job in procurement. Your boss will say, guys, I give you this much money. Now go and get the laptop made within this money. So this is the way we call cost warning. Then we call target cost. And then based on target, say it should, should cost. Should not cost more than, less than this. Sorry, not more than this. Then we have total cost of ownership. Today we decide the supplier based on unit price. But unit price is outdated now. Can we work it out? How much is it going to cost me over his life? Today it may be costing, let's say again, items like generators, vehicles. A car may be cheaper, but the mileage is poor. So my initial cost is less, but operation cost is more, maintenance cost is more. And when I want to sell it, I may not get a good deal of it. So if you look at the total cost, end to end, so initial price may be lower, you may be attracted to place an order, but total cost is higher. So this is where we call the total cost of ownership, perform cost and benefit analysis. So we try to do the cost and benefit guys. Okay, if I'm paying 10% more, but the benefits are there. I'm working in an automobile company and I change the headlamps design. I come with the totally LED lamps now. My cost goes little up, but my sales also goes up. With the sales going up, it automatically compensates on the price side. So I'll take a few things around on this. I want each one, those who are doing this module should know what is cost avoidance, cost reduction. Cost reduction is the name indicates reduction. It's a hard dollar. It's saving, which I can show on paper this year. Avoidance is in future, I negotiate in the next year, we'll do this, we'll do that. Great, it's avoidance, but not reduction. It may be avoiding in the future. So avoidance is in the future, a reduction is what I'm able to show this year in my balance sheet. This saving has come because of me, or because of my team. So that is what we call cost reduction and cost avoidance. Life cycle cost, as I said to you, initial cost, service cost, maintenance cost, operating cost, and disposal. You add all of them together, then it becomes the life cycle cost. There's another concept of value. We always say, guys, like you and me or anyone around me think, guys, okay, should I find iPhone, Apple phone, or should I find this, another ones, Samsung? Sometimes you say, guys, okay, I'm spending a little more money but the value is more. What means value? Value means basically the worth. Some items are worth it even if you pay more. So the focus is all about the value. So if you can see in the picture, the last one, you can see the worth is more than the cost. But if worth and cost is same, or in the first one where the cost is more, but the market value is less, that means I'm not getting a value out of it. So that's what the meaning is value. Value means is that basically functions divided by the cost. Cost models, which I want everybody should know it, there's a material cost, labor cost, and expense. And any office you go around, there's a direct, indirect, 
labor also direct labors, indirect labors, work supervisors, and expenses. And overhead comes from indirect here, indirect labor, indirect expense around. Indirect expense could be your sales expenses around, maintenance expenses, finance, designers, they're all my indirect labor. They are all my overheads. Sometimes overhead could be as big as direct expense around. Financial analysis, working capital, working capital. Any company which survives, sometimes you'll find they're showing a big profit, but they don't have a cash to pay salary even. So working capital is equally important around for the success of a company. You can't run on credits all the time. You need to look at the current ratios. You need to look at the quick ratios. Current ratio means what are the current assets, current liabilities should be more than one. I mean, this company is viable. So any supplier, when you give a contract, somewhat knowledge of these words should be there around so that you can understand the company's financial credibility part. Nowadays, the new concept, which is there on leasing. I know we do the leasing on the hall side, but they're all leasing on the equipment side. It's very common, people take it. Let's say in the good old days, we used to have, in our office, we had around 40,000 people working around in New York. So each floor was having, firstly, each person was having his own printer. Then we started saying, guys, each printer is giving ozone. Then they said, we don't need a printer next to me. I said, okay, then we'll put down one printer for the whole floor, one office. Office of, let's say, 15 people or 20 people, we'll have one printer. Then we came around, we had the photocopiers, Xerox photocopiers. They're all managed by office. We used to buy hundreds of them. Out of hundreds, 40 were not working many times. Either paper is not there, if the toner is not there, the cartridge is not there, then say, guys, another headache. So we said, guys, we'll outsource it. Okay. Somebody else will bring his own property. They'll come every week and lick the, how many papers have been taken out. They'll come and change the paper. They'll come and change. And we pay them based on number of paper printed. So we, out of all hundreds and all hundreds were working. Less nuisance, less maintenance. So nowadays, I think many people are coming up. And I have used this even for the laptop also. In Geneva, when we were there, we had 20 people around. And we had one IT person. So whenever we need the IT person was never there. I'm talking on the very beginning of 96 when computers were just coming up new. Sorry, 86, 86, 87. So we shifted up. Then we said, guy, outsource it. And we have made a contract with the company. We said, guy, you'll provide the laptops. You'll provide the computers to us. And the moment we call you, your person should be available within one hour. So that model is now working many places around. I have taken a one quiz out of this, again, module, you can say, which of the following would best facilitate successful implementation and recommendation made by value analysis. If your guys are not knowing what is value analysis, just cramming a book will not make you pass. Let me tell you one thing. American system, the way we have learned around, if you don't know the subject, you don't know the term even, if I say, what is caucus? And you don't know what is caucus, you can't answer the question. If I say it's a value engineering or value analysis, you don't understand the difference. You can't answer this question. Then some of you may say it is coming out of the course. It's not coming out of the course, except in the book, it may not have been explained in a detailed way. No book in the American exams will cover comprehensively. You have to go look at the words. If you feel you're not understood it, Either you ask us or go down and search it in the way, Google search. Understanding the clear relationship between functionality and the cost and their own. Understanding and appreciate key other influences on the cost around. So value analysis basically is dealing with cost. I cannot change any specs. I'm in a procurement. I can't change specs immediately. They have asked me to procure as for that design, I'll go, but if I feel I got a good feedback from supplier, the handle example I gave it to you, I have a good cross-functional team, that's the best thing I can do. If you want to implement, otherwise nobody's going to listen to me. 
He said, guys, you are, no, you are not a technical guy. How can you teach us? It becomes ego issues. And nothing will happen. Okay, guys, I'm taking the next module. See, sourcing, sourcing, sourcing. The very first word is supply base analysis. How big is my supply base? I remember the word once I read of Rotten Tatas in the newspaper when the nano was not doing well. He used the word, the heading was rationalize the supply base. The CEO of the company was the chairman of the Tatas group. He said, guys, rationalize the supply base. If you've got too many suppliers and your business is being spread to 10 companies, narrow down to two or three more business possibly then I can negotiate better pricing also. Nature of sources and their effects on procurements. If I'm buying from a companies, if I'm buying from a dealers, or if I'm buying from abroad, or if I'm buying in the local companies, what is the effect on the business around? I think last year we have seen when items were coming from very far off, only one supplier. But that company goes into some problems the whole supply line get disrupted. Existing versus new sources. I have existing suppliers. And I know very well there are new suppliers possible. But very few people take the challenge of switching over. If it works well, everybody will pat you. If it doesn't work, but then nobody will pat you. They'll say, oh, you made a useless job. Advantage of taking a challenge is that if you are successful, you are the hero. But if you want to go as a status quo, then fine, but you will never become the hero. You'll be always a back, the back student, you know, the, like in a class. So you have to take the risk. I remember the case, we used to buy one item. We were spending around $15 million. There were only two suppliers, one from UK and one from Denmark. Actually, they belong to the same companies. And uh, the whole, every time we did the bidding, it was going to them too. Then we hired another guy, he was a Vietnamese guy, and uh, he joined us. He said, Krishna, why are these only two suppliers? Suppliers know very well that these guys are comfortable with this supplier, they will not buy from you, they will not even come. He said, Krishna, I want to try with some suppliers from South Korea and others. He did it. And he brought the business price to one third. He changed some specifications also. So he brought the price to one third. So this is where you need to take some challenges. Around. You need to look through your own business acumen, guys. Why we are paying so much? Can I cut down the cost? Can I negotiate better things? So we have the decision again, evaluation tools, receiving, controlling, analyzing offers, technical analysis, offer capabilities, and assess international market develop internal sources of materials. The example I think I, the example I covered you meant touches many points around. So example giving means I want you to be very clear their roles are used. Some of you may not have come up across because in my lifetime, I've seen many examples globally. So I can give you as many examples and clarify the concept around. Evaluation. Screening is the first one. Technical and management response oral presentation. Sometimes you're not convinced. We say, guys, can you explain us? Oral presentations, evaluation of cost proposals. Then we find the baffles. And last is rating, ranking of the proposal. I'll say, this is number one, this is number two, number three. Each one may have his own pros and cons. So then it can be decided collectively. Keep in mind, because since you're dealing with money matters, every decisions are done collectively. You don't want fingers to be pointed to you why you only this. So sometimes we have done it, but then this leads into issues as well. Coming back to the buying strategies, small values, one-time buying. I don't need regularly. It's a spot buy. There's another one which I need regularly. I'm making a refrigerators. I need a compressor on a regular basis. And we used to buy from Kiloska. So we used to buy every So that means I need three weeks to three months supply. Then there's a forward buying. I, guys, I know very well this, this part is coming from Thailand. And Thailand affects this time maybe as per the weather forecast, they may have floods. 
That means my delivery may not happen. My production will come to a standstill. My workers will be idle. So that means I'm doing the forward part. In advance, I'm buying. And I've also known that it's going to be a strike in this company's around, I buy. I know the price may increase, again, I buy. Speculative means I'm only hoping in the future something could happen versus speculative. So I'm speculating the, this is more about the currency part. Forward buying is okay, this could happen fine, but speculating means I'm speculating, guys. Our currency is okay now, but maybe by another five months, six months, it's going to become weaker. So why not I do the hedging part and buy? So there's another thing is just in time. This is a very popular word. So when I was studying from the MBS program in the US, GIT, GIT, GIT. It came from Japan, concept-wise, very popular subject. But last year we have seen, now people say, guys, just in time is not good enough. It's just like many of us go for the exercises, we want to be slim. And as much slim to look nice, but if one day we don't get a food, we get in trouble. Same happened with the companies also. The concept of just in time is there. I've seen the just in time in Japan when I went to the Toyota units because we were buying a lot from them. One hour, two hours inventories, items are coming, pouring in, depending on the schedule. But today, if the disruption happens, the whole plant comes to a standstill. So now people say, guys, okay, GIT is not a bad, but we want to be agile. We want to be responsive. Another one is consignment part. They'll say, guys, okay, I don't want to have big inventories, but I want on my supplier keeping my stock. They keep 10 days, 10 days stock, or one month stock, whatever you want to decide. So it is not your stock. Stock is for you, but it's not in your name. It is in the books of their account. From accounting book, it is in their supplier's name. So that would be called the consignment part. Financial tools, hedging, I'm sure by now you must be knowing it. If currency is expected to be weaker and weaker, then you say, guys, let me hedge. If you're particularly importing it. If you're importing, you say, guys, my expenditure per month is around $1 lakh. And if dollar loses by, becomes stronger by 10%, I'm going to lose a lot. So then you say, guys, okay, in six months, can I hedge it? Then you go to the bank and try to hedge against some particular rate. Global sourcing, market factors, improved technologies, cost factors, environmental factors, competitive factors. So all these factors are important around when we are dealing with global sourcing. I think last year was a major, major lesson for us about global sourcing whole world was coming from one or two supply chain. Supply chain hubs were basically two countries. But now people are saying, guys, we need to be more. In each region, we need to have hubs around so that we don't land into the same situations again. Here I've got one small quiz around, again on the evaluation part. The supply manager recently sent out the RFP. And this guy is making a gold-plated brass rod. So the rod size is given 18 inch plus minus one by 64 inch plus minus. That's the length. The coating is 18 carats. And the coating could be chained plus minus 10 microns. So then what the question is, all were of similar quality requirements. And which of the following would be the best procedures to determine? Again, for the interest of time, I'm just saying utilize benchmark has no meaning. Check supplier reference has no meaning. What we need to develop is supplier ranking tool. How do I, what factor I should give around? Before I select, is the price only criteria around? Is the past reference around? Past credibility is important. So you need to come with a ranking tool and give the weightage to each point around. So that's approach is very important. Now. Reference is okay. But then I need to come with a ranking tool. The reference could be only 20% marks. On this quiz, because at the end of the day, when you sit down for the CPP certification, you're going to go through the, all these exams around. Time bound is very clear. So you have 60 questions. And each question is equal marks. 
There's no negative scoring, I hope you by no. So maximum, if you clear all the questions correct, you will get 600 marks. Hello. It's 420, 70% around. I know 420 looks a little odd. And I told mm -hmm. my team, I need to change this term also. But anyway, as on today, it stands 70% of them. So, but keep in mind, these questions are very practical. They're not just cramming the question. Now, like this question, if I read, which book I will find this question? Nowhere. I have to use my practical skill around, guys. Okay, the length I know tolerance. I know the thickness of the gold plating. Now I'm going to select between the five or six suppliers. What basis are they going? Is it the price alone or some other factors also? Around? So that means your experience, your skill will come into the picture. If you don't have the skill, then you only look at the price or you look at the other things around, then you may have. If you're looking at the price benchmark, then that may not be the only successful criteria. Because when we come out of the college, we only talk of price. When we go a little further, we talk of qualities. Then we go further than that experience of 10 years. We say, guys, quality is one parameter. Price is another parameter. Then there are other financial strength of the company is another parameter. Then you come with a complete ranking around. And that comes with experience around. Next comes strategic sourcing. The word is strategic sourcing. Sourcing, yes, but strategically. What are we going to learn in this whole module is, so this is where I want the training material which is given to you. If you feel this stuff address this one, go into the further details, check somewhere here and there. There are many books available. So overview of strategics. What is strategic sourcing? The value of strategic sourcing. Key element, there are seven steps I'll touch on those parts around. And why it came up around and why it was where it is going around. So that's one. The next step of this is category management. And that is not part of this book. So that's the way we look at it. Strategic sourcing, you keep in mind there are three components. It's organized. It's part of the ongoing enterprise process. If you say I'm dealing strategically. It's ongoing activity. It's not one time. And systematically means there's a standard process. And I'll walk through with you the seven steps. So it's systematic, organized, and the next is collaborative. Keep in mind, you cannot bring revolution alone. You need to carry your team stakeholders with you. It's a cross-functional, collaborative internally and externally. I remember one company, we were working with a German company in Diwadi. They came with a strategic sourcing and it happened with their own training programs around. Very well done through the consulting companies and finally it failed. Because the inside customers, which were on the shop floor workers, they refused. Because we get biased sometimes. They were not accepting the change at all. So keep in mind strategic sourcing, you need to be very good communicator as well. So you have two pillars around sourcing, which could be strategic sourcing and the buying part, which is P2P. On strategic sourcing, you're doing identifying the suppliers, making long-term agreements. So when the need comes, these people are placing order. That's why we are calling money on the table means I made a long-term agreement with the good deals. Now the deal will materialize only when you place the order. So that's where two parts are there. So seven steps, again, let me start. The very first is conduct internal analysis. I join a company, let's say first time. I ask them, guys, can you show me what are the spend of your last years? How much spend is going to be this year? And which spends are on strategic item? Which items are on tactical item? Which is on routine item? Which is on bottleneck item? I do my whole research, not alone, as a cross-functional team, one person from design, one from production, one from finance, a team of four or five people. Then I start to find key guys, these are the items where we are spending too much money. We need to focus on this. We collectively decide. Then we also try to know what is the market of this. Who are the suppliers now? 
Who else could be there in the world? The guy who joined me in the Vietnamese guy in Geneva. So he said, guys, Christian, we have about two suppliers. And I can assure you, if you allow me, I will have five or six suppliers in the next years. And he did it. And he saved a lot of money around. He saved around four to five million dollars. So assess supply market. Collect supplier information. Collect the information from suppliers. Talk to them. Then develop sourcing strategy guide. Okay, now I know the market knowledge. Now I have to see sourcing strategy. How do I go? What method to follow? Then evaluate the offers around, negotiate, and lastly implement. But don't keep in mind is a straight line. It's an iterative process. And if I during this last step, I find I'm not very happy. I go back to step one. So this process carries on. For some item, I may carry on for two years, three years, same contract being extended. But some after a few years, when the market might have changed, technology might have changed, I may have to start again from one to seven. So these seven steps are called the part of the strategic sourcing. Keep in mind when you try to bring strategic sourcing, you're trying to bring a change. And change is the most difficult thing. Anything you try to bring a change anywhere around, people will say, guys, oh no, don't tell us. We are happy with what we are doing. So change management. So this is where if you are not a good leadership qualities, you will not succeed. So you need to have a leadership qualities also. You should be able to convince the people about it. And if you have a strength of a collaborative approach where other players are supporting you, you will succeed. Now, when we do this whole strategic sourcing, the game starts from spin. I want everyone you should know those who are doing this program on CPP. What is three dimension, 3D spend around? Three dimensions. It's not 3D printing, it's 3D. Three dimensions, supplier dimension, commodity dimension, and location. I have, let's say, 14 plants. Within the one company, I've got 14 units around. Each unit is asking me to buy, and the procurement is done by the procurement, but they are being bought for different departments. So I know the location and the department. And I also know what commodity we bought for them and which supplier providing them. Supplier, commodity, and the location of the department. So I've got three dimensions. So I can take any part of the queue and I can tell you this department spends so much and these are the suppliers who supplied it and this is the commodity. Then I can put collective in those. So this once I've done the spend part, so I want everybody, I know I'm touching very superficially, you could call it, but you need to really understand the spend queue very well to answer these questions around which will come in the exams. And once you know the spend and you know the risk of each one, that means you need to have market knowledge, you need to have spend. 80, 20 concepts around, divide them into four boxes. And this pictorial view gives you the different approach. If item belongs to routine, I could be very relaxed. The guy is sitting on the swimming pool, relaxed and still doing the job. And the guy who's dealing with the critical items, you can see at the back of him, anytime it can explode. The guy can't take a sleep. The guy has to think of the critical way because there's only one or two suppliers. If they ditch me, my production come to standstill. There's a leverage. I'm doing high spend. My risk is very low. L, low risk. My approach is different. I can hammer on the price and I want to get best savings. Bottleneck means the risk is high, amount is less. I want to buy in a bulk so that production never stops. So keep in mind that whenever you guys are doing around, Maybe one example can help you if I can tell you. There's a one auto company in India. Yes, gearbox used to come from Thailand. It's going back to 2011. In Thailand, there was a flood, three month road delivery. 
you can imagine around if you are the head of the procurement no delivery for 3 months no car going outside you may be feeling i'm very important just because of me no car is going out if that become negative for you you will be the first one to be thrown out of the job so keep in mind this is where the skill is required around to understand is it a bottleneck item is it a critical item is it a leverage and whenever you see there's a risk around don't sit tight on it tell the top management look for the support so this is where importance is there so this gives you the various approaches on different items again it gives you same clarities on different characteristics next come the sourcing strategy supplier strategy could be leverage partner but then comes what should how should i divide my function i got 14 15 dip companies should i centralize should i do cross functional should i decentralize should i simplify so combination of the two will give me the approach at all so this is where i remember the case with accenture who were dealing with they were a big procurement unit dealing with oil companies all companies are doing some activity centralized but then some activities are decentralized in bangalore and other places around so you need to look around where to decentralize because you want to cut the cost also if i'm sitting in us let's say here i have to pay 20 dollars an hour minimum maybe more than that if i can do it at a lower cost place why not so this is where company take the benefit of each other financial strength i have told you already what is balance sheet profit loss statement at least you should have a good understanding of both the subjects about current ratios so when i was you are trying to look at the companies how to look at the balance sheet read the balance sheet strength of the companies this need to be checked coming back to the negotiations again a part of strategic sourcing the negotiation power come from three things first thing you need to prepare yourself don't just go unprepared and say okay guys i'm going to sit and have a meeting with you what for you have not done your homework preparation and planning strategies and tactics strategies should be this for you talking to the guy first give the chance them to speak if you start saying something talk let them talk and discuss so guys okay we have seen your proposal but let them explain around how did they come to this price instead of you straight away jumping on guys your price is too stupid bad blah 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 you say guys okay we have gone through it could you just explain us how did you come to this price can you give us the details around if they are not done the homework they will fail if they have done the homework they will explain then you can ask intelligent question on each point by point and if they get the concept that you guys know the subject if i have come from a technical background i can see what is the manufacturing cost how much time should take how much is this cost i can ask hundreds of questions around so strategy has to be there tactics has to be there face to face skill that is the most important thing even till today i feel around when you grow in your careers understanding the psychology is very important which i think in colleges we don't teach people how to read people how to look at the body language of each one the way they move the face the way they show the hanging the way the eyes move around so we need to learn that language also i know we all understand the love languages but we don't understand how to deal in the negotiation read people around preparation and planning if you have done all these things then you are ready for effective negotiation so this is where the strategic things comes up i think we are again negotiation philosophy which we talked earlier so if your items are belonging to tactical profit that means high spend low risk market knowledge market knowledge if it's a strategic one high risk high spend i certainly need to the media mark market around but i need to have a very good relationship think of a company that you are making laptops and you are buying intel chips pentium chips and it's coming from intel only so only one supplier you have no backup if intel does not give you the chips what do you do nothing 
So you need to come around for strategic item, different approach, tactical acquisitions, you will try to make a catalogs or something. Tactical profit will be different approach. So risk and spend can give you different approaches. So strategy will change. Okay, guys, so this is the way I'm looking at the seven steps. I've given you a glimpse of few ones, but rest I know you know it. Now here again, question could come up around why I took this typical question, I'll answer you. Now let's say I'm trying to do, in order to prepare for negotiation, a new contract, and you are the supply management professionals, wants to know how I supply price engineering service. The guy I'm asking for engineering service. Engineering services could be designing, Engineering services could be in IT business. Engineering service could be in highway, could be in buildings, could be manufacturing. So I'm looking at the cost part. The guy will say, okay, I'm going to charge you so much. If I want to go really in a micro level, I say, guys, can you tell me how many people I bought? What are the time of each one's around? What is the rate of each one's around? And there are complexities around. Now, question come, the answers are there now, the strategic sourcing has nothing to do with it. Market analysis may be relevant, but job analysis also not relevant. It's a regression now. If somebody say, guys, oh, this is not taught to us. I know in the whole book, if you wrote, because CPP, you will not find the meaning of regression. Then you say this question has come out of the slavers. I think this out of the slavers concept exists only in India because we are taught, you guys, read this book and everything will come from the book. In American system, I spent two years there. So no, my friend, you have to read a little more than that. So somewhat, I would say, first thing, the good thing would be that you should, if you are a member of ISM, you get the quiz every week. That quiz will give you a wonderful approach to this. You get the newsletter, read the newsletters. So once you read them, you get a much bigger knowledge of the subjects. Don't expect that if I've given you in the online material, 500, 400 slides, you say, guys, everything has to come from this. I'm sorry that this won't happen. So try to learn a little bit more on that part also. So regression analysis around, where we look at the various parameters, which are my independent variables, dependent variables, how is the relationship between them? Then we work out the cost. So if you're not knowing it, then you'll get lost with the question. You'll say, guys, this question is out of syllabus. You read strategic sourcing, you read market analysis, you read job analysis, but I didn't teach you on the regression side. So that's a little bit extra knowledge is required on that side. So we expect that college level, people must have taught you regression. Okay guys, the next one, SRM. Here are the learning opportunities and the benefits of rationalizing supply base. So here what we are looking around is, Rationalize, rationalize, rationalize. Develop relationship with supply. Different type of relationship. I could have very casual relationship. I could be wonderful buddy with a guy around. I could be wonderful partner there. I could have venture capital there. I mean, I could have my own share in the company. So it depends the whole spectrum of relationship. If I feel my, why should I wish I have got 20,000 suppliers. My relation with 20,000 will vary. Some are very important to me for my success. Some are very low. I've got too many choices around. My relationship is different. Then the next is supply diversity program. I think this word is very, very popular. And here I see in the in American culture, because the whole society is very diverse. It's a country of immigrants. Here, supply diversity on terms of genders, in terms of color, race, whatever you may be. So diversity part is there around, and they feel if any company has a diverse people, if our companies are having people only from one community, our diverse communities around, I think the productivity is better, the performance is better. So I think there is a big focus here on diversity to give those who are not privileged enough, they're also given opportunities here. That's why you see in America, the head of Google is in person with Indian origins. Look at the Microsoft. Look at Adobe's. Look at IBM's. Here's a diversity program. So everybody is given opportunities and not by your, the focus is all about your intelligence. Then we come to the develop new supplier qualification plans. 
Some qualifications are required as a regulatory part, some are safety, some are reliabilities. But on top of it, you need something more. And if you want to move into environmental aspects also, you may have to add something more. Supplier performance evaluation. And then you feel that some suppliers are useless. They are not coming with innovative ideas, innovative products. They are not even delivering you. You will have to have supplier performance. And then you have to come with the next extra. And we develop this performance part in the ERP systems. If somebody wants, I'll be very happy to clarify. We developed in 2008 or nine in the US. So we came up with five parameters. First parameter was the price variation. Second parameter was on the time duration, how much time it takes to deliver, delay or faster, quantities, after sales service. So like this, we took four or five parameters. Out of the five parameters, four were done by the computer itself. No human involvements. The only one place the human involvement was there, what is the feedback? So putting all of them, then anytime I could see the performance of the supply online. Keep in mind, SRM is, if you look at this one, three parts, demand planning, supply strategic sourcing, and this is the one, the post, that's what we call the supplier manager. Managing supplier. So it's again part of my SRM, relationship partner. See, in the good old days, we had these three parts, strategic sourcing, demand management, buy, and this three parts as a part of procurement or supply chain. SRM was independent, but now people say, no, it is a part of it. All four work together. So that's what we have come up with. Now, now where does the SRM come? You award a contract, you KPI, key performance indicators. So each one of you should know KPIs. I know in the material you may not find much, but I want everybody to know what is KPI, what is SLAs. Service level agreements, KPI. Now, based on this, I make a supplier performance management. The contract management is over here. But then based on that, I'm coming with my output. Guys, okay, I had a good experience, a bad experience, then I do the SI, supplier relationship management. Ways of promoting relationship is very, very important around. So those who are senior level people or those who want to be really the top tomorrow supply chain managers, they need to learn how to make promoting relationships. Involve top management periodically. Seek to establish common focus. Pay invoices on time. Equitable table treatment for all the suppliers. Periodic surveys. And business review, supplier development. If you feel supplier is very good, but they need some technical help, help them in developing it. That's what we need. Supplier mentoring, it can be done by training, technical assistance, providing softwares, and total quality management around. In principle, what we have seen, we spend a lot of time on sourcing, tenders, and contract, very less on relationship. And when we feel, oh guys, I've got the money in my pocket, I'm the one who's spending it, we don't care for suppliers. But when you are in a tough time, you have money, but you can't buy the goods because the goods are in shortage. So relationship comes in. Measurements and improvements parts of it. So this is where I also will say focus is required particularly in the pandemic, the one recent pandemic we have seen, relationship also counts a lot. Again, here I put down one quiz around, so you can see here the, the process that determines and maintain appropriate numbers of supplier by category or item, depending on the risk and value of the item is called what? Obviously it is not supply management, Either neither ERP, neither process mapping, it's an appropriate number. The word is appropriate numbers. It's called rationalization. So keep in mind that whenever you will get these questions, you will find out of four, two you can easily throw off. ERP has nothing to do with the appropriate number. Process mapping has nothing to do with the appropriate number. It could be supply management. Somebody could say supply management is also part of it. Supply based rationalization, but then among the two, you have to think around which is closer to it. So that will help you to pass the exam. So I can tell you for all the questions, you will find out of four choices in multiple choices, two will have no meaning connection with that subject. 
So only your left eye, the two you can do even. I know your good luck. You can say okay, this or that. But if you can use little bit of your common sense, maybe you reach the best one. The last one. Let me talk about the legal implication at this club. Every business where the money is involved, risk is there. Now, when the risk, you know it, are we legally safe? So you need to know the legal implication and the risk management together. That's the way we do it. What forms a contract? Five components. The contract formation, which is coming under the India Contract Act, dates back to 1872. Goes back to the British time. All the changes have happened, but the five things are not changed. There has to be an offer. There has to be an acceptance. There has to be consideration. There has to be competent party and legality. Offer means supplier has given you offer, or you are giving an offer, and supplier accepts it as it is, mirror image, no change, no comma, dot, any here and there. The moment you put a comma, that means you are giving a counter offer. It has to be agreed as it is, mirror image, no question asked. If supplier is not happy, they can come with a counter offer. You review it again, give a new offer, and then let it be accepted. Considerations, money. Without money, no contracts. Even sometimes we hire people on a pro bono basis, consultants. They say oh, we are working free. Yes, but contract will be of one rupee. We'll not say zero rupee. Even the word free contract, we will be paying one at least. On the paper, will be shown one rupee. Consideration has to be there. I would say reasonable one. Competent parties. Whether the parties are mentally competent, age-wise competent. Somebody looks very older, but the guy might be very young, maybe only sixteen or seventy. So until the guy has a maturity age above eighteen, they are not allowed to sign any contract. Mental capacity. Somebody can prove that this guy signed it because mentally he was sick. We see in the movies also some old parents have signed something and then someone comes, sorry, sorry, this contract is not valid. The sale is invalid because this guy is mentally problem. Here's a doctor's certificate. The legality of the purpose allowed. Contract cannot be done for something which legally not allowed. If somebody says, guys, I'll pay you so much if you kill someone. Then, if you don't kill, I will. I'll take you to the court. No, legally it's not allowed. So this is what we do around. So there are five parameters which form the contracts around. And I'm leaving the question to you: Is PO a contract or not? So think it over, because PO is an offer. You send an offer to me, I may or may not accept. You can't take me to the court. So PO becomes a contract when I accept it. Contract types could be there. Could be fixed price. The best is fixed price in the beginning. Second could be cost reimbursable. Whatever money you spend, show on showing me the papers, and then I reimburse you. Unit price. Some are very complex things. You know. Want to hire a consultant? Consultant rate you can fix around. It's a combination of the two. It's a hybrid of fixed price and cost reimbursable. So you could fix the rate for the consultant. You can also decide the number of hours plus and minus, or some material has to be bought. You reimburse it. That's where we do it around. Contract management so again, risk mitigation, compliance with all the terms and conditions. Schedule mode monitoring part, approve contract invoices around. All that things come into the basket around. In quote terms, in quote terms, in quote terms. I know this could have been a two-day session only for inco terms, but I'm just leaving this slide to you. Look around what inco terms you're using. Inco terms. The name is international. International CO commerce terms. 2020 is the latest one. I know the material which you have still cost 2010. I think I will try to revise it. It's 2020 now. In international commerce terms. So this can also be used for domestic purposes. So in quote terms, now it can be used for domestic also. 
basically the purpose is. I'm the buyer, you are the sellers. So who's going to pay for the movement of the goods? Who's going to pay for the unloading of the goods? Who's going to pay if the goods are lost on the way? Who's going to pay on the way the truck is met with an accident? Or the ship is sunk? Or the captain has thrown your container into the sea because of typhoon? All those things are covered with three letters. The lovely words, three words, three letters covers everything. It's based on International Chambers of Commerce in Geneva. So that's the way I've tried to explain all the points you can see from transfer of risk up to loading and unloading at your house. And who pays the custom duty? All those points are clarified here. So my request to you would be, please, each one of you should have a copy of this on your place if you are dealing with Inkota. And then you also need to look around what type of insurance it is. Is it C type? Is it A type? Is it B type? There are three types of insurance. A is called all risk, but technically it is not totally all risk. If on the way somebody puts a missile on your goods, gone, you're not covered. If on the way there's a war going on, not covered. Somebody takes away the ship and then again, it's not covered. So there are some complications. So look around, at least C should not be there. C is the lowest, lowest coverage. So this gives you on the C what they cover is the fire part, sinking, overturning of vehicles, vessel collisions, discharge of the cargoes around, and can you imagine even the insurance part? Somebody will say, guys, this is where I'm saying procurement is becoming a profession. I mean, procurement is a part of the supply chain. It's becoming a bigger profession, I would call. So you can imagine around, you need to know everything. You need to know about the costing. You need to know about the negotiation. You need to know about the insurance. You need to know income terms. You need to know the wide range of subjects. So this justifies procurement is no more the old-fashioned clerical function. It's a profession. So here there are some common mistakes which happen. So I think I've added up. So this is available to you. You may not, this is, I just added up. Risk part, it could be financial risk. Obviously the biggest risk is money. Operational risk, my whole production has come to a standstill. Brand, reputation risk, if the product which I bought from you I'm buying a break from you and my car is failing, my brand is affected. I'm buying the shoes made in some X country, a Y shoe, and I find the upper sole is going off, upper part is going from the sole is weak. My reputation is affected. Legal risk. If my branding is used and then you're using it for wrong purpose, there could be legal risk around, environmental risk and technical risk. So there could be wide range of risk around, so we need to work it out, how to we mitigate. The framework is like this, identify the risk, analyze the risk, control the risk. And then after that, if you can't control, you can't make it zero risk. Let's be very honest. If I want to make a zero risk, risk is everywhere. When I leave my house, there's a risk, somebody can come and hit me. But does not mean that I will not walk outside. I'll take precaution. I'll try to see if I can pass on the risk to someone. I can reduce the risk around. I'll assess them. So you need to assess the risk around. Risk management planning part. There are some areas where you've got impact is very high. Some case the impact is very low. Likelihood also is there. Risk is there so many in the beginning but some are having a probability is higher, some case probability is less. So the probability depends on the past data. If it is a high impact and likely to occur, and high impact but unlikely to occur, if I, this is high impact mean I'm, and likely to happen means I'm going to work on it. The high impact but unlikely, I'm not going to spend time much on it. I can't remove all the boxes. Some will remain, and I'll tell the management that these risks are there, but only 10%. And if I want to remove it, it will cost me a lot. It may not be viable. So that's what we need to do. Again, the quiz I've got here is, which of the following can best be labeled as a brand and reputation? Now, 
again, you could call as a common sense, but then let's look around from your knowledge angle. A glitch on the assembly line it sometimes speeds up the line. The speed has been set on the production line. 20 pieces will move every minute. Instead of 20, somebody's glitch has come. Instead of 20, not 25 pieces are moving. There's nothing wrong in the quality. The guy is working, except there's a more pressure on me if I'm assembling them. You supply man employees do not receive enough training. People have not got the training. It's fine, but there's no brand reputation part. Large batch of products came off in the production line with quality problem. Now this quality problem could have reputation problem. Now the next one you look around, salesperson do not give the production story. Enough lead time to meet customer's need for the rush hour. So they are not giving sufficient time so if you look as a totality basis, the only the C with quality problem can bring my bad reputations. Arrests are not even relevant. One or two may be very close to it, but not very much at all. Well, friend, before I close up this one, again, I want to tell you guys why I'm again emphasizing it's a profession. Profession means one need to get certified and justify to your peers, justify to the MNCs, Guys, you are well equipped to do this job around. The changing face of procurement, and maybe reputation I may call, procurement has come a long way from the reactive functions to a strategic partner. Now the focus is to move away from being cost saving center to a growth partner. So you're becoming at a C level now. You're, so C level jobs around, whether you are a CPO, whether you are chief supply officers, with increased globalization integration, it will be appropriate to call procurement as supply man. So even in some companies, I remember one organization I met around, the head used to be called chief procurement officer, now he's called chief supply chain officer. Right? And procurement is a part of it. Logistic is a part of it. So this is how the things are changing. Well, friend, with this, again, I want to thank you, everyone, for your patient hearing. 